Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Quintos and Dr. Henwina for inviting me to be part of the UPMAS webinar series. When Wang and Wino asked me to present this as part of our final talk for the webinar series, I was in panic because asthma is such a huge topic. And I think by the time I was able to make my slides, I had changed the learning objective to something more manageable and more Concise. So I will have a different, so different set of learning objectives as we go along. And welcome to our reactor, Dr. Francis Dairit, who is uh, joining us from the great state of South Carolina. These are my declaration of conflicts. Uh, none, of this, of uh, none of this, however, will affect the content of my talk today, both talks today. These are my learning objectives. Since asthma is such a broad topic, I thought I would narrow it down for um, today's conversation um, to the meat or the Bible of um, asthma diagnosis and management. It's, a, it's an 800-page mammoth um, document that has been published uh, three times by the National Heart, Blood, and Lung Institute of the NIH. And um, its third version uh, came out in 2007. There's a current um, proposal by the expert panel to um, provide new updates as new data and evidence has um, been published over the last eight years. So a third part of my learning objectives would be to present the six updates proposed by the National Asthma Expert Panel um, that would be uh, included in the next version. And I will discuss in further detail four out of those six. And um, lastly, I have a link um, that will be available to all our participants. Be available discussing the proper reviewing the proper use of um, spacer device. The proper, reviewing the proper use of um, spacer device. First, I'd like to present um, a comparison of prevalence data between the U.S. and the Philippines. Prevalence data between the U.S. and the Philippines. The World uh, Allergy Organization has um, published the, what we call the White Book in 2013. They've, uh, they rang like this uh, alarm bell that all types of allergic diseases have been increasing worldwide. Um, doctors Verona, um, Dr. Kwong of the Philippine Society of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, uh, in 2014 published um, the results of the National Nutrition and Health Survey. And it describes uh, the prevalence of asthma among Filipino adults. The prevalence of asthma among Filipino adults. And it's, it, to date, it's one of the biggest um, surveys, and they used the ISAC survey tool, which is the International Study of Asthma and Allergy in Childhood. Um, and questioning um, uh, Filipino adults 20 and older. Uh, using the parameter of wheezing in the last 12 months, the overall prevalence is 8.7%. Interestingly, the, the preponderance, the prevalence rates in men um, is higher than women. And you'll see later that this is um, reversed from, for the, compared to the U.S. data. Now, when the ISAC survey uses question of ever wheeze or lifetime um, wheezing, the prevalence rates increased to 14.3% compared to 8.7%. So um, you can see from this percentage rates that there's a huge burden of disease um, for uh, Filipinos. The childhood prevalence uh, studies have been published in the past, but most of these surveys were focused on, on Metro Manila. Um, the most recent childhood prevalence study was published in 2003. Um, and the, there has been uh, a huge range reported by these studies, and it goes anywhere from 9.2% to 27.4%. 
um, I just made this um, bar graph just to show you the comparisons um, between childhood asthma. Um, and this set of graphs will be um, adult asthma. And the blue, blo the blue block, the blue bar is showing um, the results for uh, wheezing the last 12 months among males and wheezing. And this uh, mint green bar is wheezing in the last 12 months for adult female Filipinos. And um, this is the uh, ever wheeze question, which is a lot higher than um, the prevalence that we discussed earlier. So I've included the link to uh, the journal that was published um, for the Philippine data for um, your information and, and reference. Okay, meanwhile, the Center for Disease Control in the, in the U.S. in 2013 um, published the data of um, the U.S. overall prevalence, which is 7.3%. And um, the breakdown for children below, eight, um, um, below 18 is, shows the preponderance of um, asthma among males. However, this rate is reversed. Um, as the children are surveyed um, beyond 18 years of age and into adulthood, that prevalence rate reverses and more females are affected with asthma by the time they enter late adolescence and late adulthood. Now this is just a summary of, of that slide that shows the male uh, predominance of, in terms of prevalence and male children actually catch up, uh, sorry, female ch children catch up with the males between the 15 to 17 age group. And that trend um, continues, a uh, reverse trend continues as um, you survey more adults up to age 65. Um, so this is uh, the difference between the prevalence rates between the US and the Philippines. Um, more females are affected um, with asthma in the U.S. compared to uh, Filipino adults. And I defer, I wonder why, and I defer this, uh, the answer to this question to my uh, Filipino colleagues who may be able to enlighten us uh, at the end of this talk. Now, uh, this is really the meat of um, any discussion for asthma diagnosis, um, treatment, and monitoring. Um, it's an 800-page, the NAEPP um, guidelines is an 800-page document um, that has gone through several revisions. And the most recent one, as I said, was published in 2007. And it's the third uh, version that has been released by uh, the NIH or uh, through the NHLBI. Um, it's... Historically, the first published guidelines were in 1991, but um, the formal document where it was actually called National Asthma Education and Prevention Program was um, brought out in 1997, and its second revision was in 2002. So the current iteration is 2007, and as you can see, there has been um, a burgeoning amount of scientific evidence that has been published uh, since 2007. Now, the difference between the 2002 and 2007 version um, was that the expert panel or the, the panel that was designated by the NIH to um, study or, or come up with the guidelines for clinicians who take care of um, patients with asthma was of the zero to four age group. Um, and this is very important for me as a pediatrician because prior to the 2007 version, we would extrapolate um, the data or the management um, approach from the age 5 to 11 year old uh, recommendations. So this is a very important uh, difference that came out in 2007, um, especially because a lot of pediatricians or a lot of family physicians refuse to label um, toddlers and kids younger than four with asthma. So now there's guidelines that backs up our, our clinical uh, suspicion and clinical diagnosis. The other main difference is that the expert panel has put 
very pragmatic guidelines in terms of diagnosis of severity and how to monitor our patients in terms of clinical control. So um, I'm going to present those in um, a chart form. Now, it, I think it's, it's, um, it, it's difficult for me to, to understand or present just the charts and make, make it very didactic. So I'd like to start off with um, a case presentation of um, a baby or like a 36-month-old baby that I um, had been following in clinic. So this is LS. He's a 36-month-old Hispanic male who came to clinic with a three-day history of an upper respiratory illness type symptoms. And he also had the, you know, the viral syndrome with it, low-grade fever, had decreased appetite. And the day prior to his consultation, um, mom noted that he was waking up, waking up coughing at night. Uh, mom was describing a whistling sound on his chest. Um, I think it's important to note this because uh, it's hard to diagnose wheezing unless you have a, a stethoscope. So this baby was, was probably in, in um, some sort of distress and his ribs were sinking in when he breathes. Upon further history taking, um, past medical history revealed that he had been to the ED during a viral season, which is usually in the winter, in the middle of the winter months. And the emergency department physician noted uh, wheezing on physical exam. So he was, the baby was sent home on albutrol, nebulized as needed, and a five day course of oral prednisolone. Since then, mom had been paying attention to his symptoms and noted that he would develop wheezing episodes when, even when he's not sick, prolonged cough, even after uh, his common cold had resolved. And um, by the way, he seems to tire very easily when he, um, and coughs easily when he runs or plays. And um, mom has poor recall, but she thinks she may have had another course of oral steroids in the winter. So what other questions should we be asking um, this mom? So um, I think prior to any, uh, um, any guidelines that we were given, um, this would be you know, intuitive to make, but now we are able to use a very formal uh, sort of chart that um, allows it to make this classification for this baby. So the two domains that the, the expert panel guidelines gives us um, are the impairment domain and the risk domain. So when the patient comes in, presents to clinic, um, the caveat here is that the patient is not on any controller. We look at the chart that corresponds to his age group. And um, these would be specific questions in, in his review of systems that we should be asking. Um, symptoms including shortness of breath, uh, recurring cough, um, chest tightness, any history of wheezing. Um, nighttime awakening is, is a significant um, component of impairment. Um, sometimes I also ask if, even if the child doesn't wake up, if the parents are woken up by uh, the baby or the toddler's own coughing. Um, the frequency of use of quick relief medications such as short acting beta agonists, apart from that used for um, prophylaxis for exercise uh, induced bronchospasm um, is also an important component of impairment. And lastly, interference with normal activity. So uh, these would be uh, guideline questions for us to address with a family when they come in for their initial visit. So let's go back to, um, let's go back to LS. Um, and ask more questions based on um, what the guidelines is, is um, suggesting for us to do. So LS coughs when he laughs in place. Um, laughing, crying um, um, would be the form of physical exertion for uh, the little babies because they're you know, probably not running yet, they're um, not in sports yet. So um, any activity that would cause them to um, have a forceful breath would be one way to, to, to gauge um, if there's a trigger uh, at home. Um, LS has been needing his albutrol nebulized approximately twice a week. However, he sleeps through the night when he's not sick, although mom did remember that they would wake up with, with his coughing and, and it wakes them up, not the baby. Interestingly, he has trouble keeping up with his peers when they are in the school playground. 
Um, and mom does recall being given a clear syrup when they were at an urgent care clinic um, uh, when their pediatrician's office was closed during the July 4th holiday. So this is another, um, I guess, classic example of, um, in the history taking, a lot of patients end up with either an oral um, bronchodilator like albuterol um, that could be misconstrued or misstated um, as in a steroid. So um, a good history would establish whether the child actually had a third course of oral steroids um, in the last six months, or a second course of oral steroids in the last six months between winter and the summer. So we go back to the to the chart that I presented earlier, and um, this is sort of like an algorithmic way to, to approach LS. Um, his mom said that they use albuterol more than twice a week, but not daily, although he doesn't um, wake up at night coughing, so I'm putting him um, under zero. They do use his short-acting um, beta agonist, his albuterol or salbutamol, uh, more than twice a week, but not daily. Um, and he has a minor limitation with um, running with his peers at the playground. Um, based on his history, it looks like that he's had uh, two courses of uh, oral steroids in the past six months. So I'm putting him under this uh, risk for exacerbation under mild persistent. And based on the guidelines, he would um, qualify for initiation of um, therapy starting with a step two. So this is the stepwise approach that the um, expert panel guidelines have um, put up um, in a very uh, intuitive, user-friendly form. So when LS um, started off and presented to clinic, he would fall under the step two uh, management. And the preferred um, medication for him would be low-dose inhaled corticosteroids. Um, in the States, the safety profile and, and studies for children have mainly included budesonide and fluticasone. So be, since they have a nebulizer at home, I think uh, LS would be a candidate for nebulized budesonide, um, which has also been well studied in terms of a safety profile and efficacy for babies and children. Um, the alternative would be to use a leukotriene receptor antagonist, which is um, currently the only medication of that um, class is Montelukast. It's approved for children up to 12 months of age. However, I tend to use inhaled steroids if um, the child has had persistent history um, and repeated use of um, oral steroids. I gravitate towards Montelukas if the patient has no history or risk factors for allergies. So he, um, what did I end up doing for, for LS? I sent him home with uh, another course of oral steroids um, because of his acute uh, respiratory distress. Um, I started him on budesonide uh, once daily and instructed mom to brush his teeth to decrease the oral deposition of um, st the steroids in the mouth and in the throat. Um, we came up with an action plan to use a short-acting um, beta agonist, examples of which would be albuterol, salbutamol, or levalbutrol, um, nebulized every four to six hours as needed. Now, the recommendation to use um, short-acting beta agonist no more frequently than every four hours is is sort of a built-in um, catch for the parents. If they're, the baby is needed or the child is needing to use a butrol for relief more frequently than four hours, then it's probably time to uh, bring the baby in for um, uh, a medical evaluation and not be treated at home. Since he's at that um, gray eight, the gray um, area where he may not be able to use an inhaler and a spacer, um, it would also be a good time to discuss uh, training the family on proper technique to use an inhaler and spacer device so they could leave an inhaler um, with albuterol or, or levalbutrol in school. 
Um, now I will be discussing this more later, but uh, there's also the discussion if the child is a candidate for uh, allergy testing for inhalant air allergens. So at follow-up, um, usually when we start a, a patient on a new intervention, especially um, an inhaled um, corticosteroid, I like to see the patient back for follow-up in four weeks, but the NAEP guidelines recommends anywhere between two to six weeks of follow-up. So at that visit, mom reports that his um, cough had resolved um, and did not need to go see his primary doctor or go to the ED for worsening symptoms. Um, after two or three days of oral steroids, the patient was um, patient and the parents were able to sleep through the night and he did not require any more albuterol for rescue. They enrolled him in kiddie, kiddie gymnastics um, and he has been uh, participating without coughing or shortness of breath. There's one um, mom's chief complaint for this visit, however, was that the baby or LS was having uh, suffering from whitish plaques at the roof of his mouth and uh, in, inside the buccal area of his cheeks, similar to cotton mouth when he was a baby. So clearly this is um, one of the side effects that we would be looking out for when um, any patient is on inhaled um, steroids. So the next component for the guidelines is the control domain. Um, and this would be when LS comes back for follow-up. So this chart is actually summarizing um, questions we would ask the families in terms of um, a response to intervention. Um, and it also uh, gives us guidelines to be vigilant about medication side effects uh, whenever our patients come for a visit. So I included this in our slide set so everybody has access to um, the summary charts that um, were published as part of this document. Um, so when he came back for his follow-up in eight weeks, um, I decided to step down his budesonide or lower the dose as recommended by the NAP guidelines to half of his budesonide dose once daily. Um, I ended up treating his um, oral thrush and uh, reinforced teaching mom how to rinse his mouth and brush his teeth every time um, they use their um, inhaled corticosteroids. We also came up with an asthma action plan and a school plan. Um, since he's not old enough to use his spacer device yet, uh, I think we just used that time during the visit to train the baby um, on how to breathe in and out of a, a tube or a spacer device for future um, use. Um, and he was also scheduled for allergy testing to address other comorbidities such as allergic rhinitis. Um, and it also will allow me to identify any possible uh, environmental triggers at home and maybe educate the family on uh, control measures that they can start. Now, um, I'm not going through the rest of the ch charts, but the guidelines do break down the severity and control to the 5 to 11 age group and over 12 age group. The difference between this and the 0 to 4 age group is that um, at age 5, we assume that most children are able to do um, a spirometry and lung function test. Um, I think Dr. Dairit will uh, be able to uh, respond to this, but a lot of pediatricians uh, and um, specialists who take care of uh, pediatric asthma patients um, find FEV1 over FEC a significant component of their um, testing. So uh, this was included here, uh, although I think I don't think it's as important for adults. Uh, again, there's a um, this component of control for 5 to 11 age groups. So this is here for your reference um, and for you to keep handy for um, clinic. Now, this is a stepwise approach for children 5 to 11 years of age. Um, at this age group, there's an introdu introduction of long-acting beta agonists. Um, so this would be for Monterol or Selmeterol. Um, this is uh, approved for kids um, in this age group, so it was added on um, as part of the stepwise management. I circled Nadocromil because this is um, 
one of the medications that is no longer available in the market. Again, this is just for um, your reference and uh, in the interest of time, uh, I will just quickly go over these charts. Uh, chromalin, which is um, part of the 0 to 4 age group, uh, is also no longer marketed. So this is another modification that the guidelines um, might change in the next publication. Um, so this is a summary of the 12 um, and above age groups. So 12-year-old children are considered or treated like adults. Um, and this chart just summarizes the normal decay of pulmonary function um, results as we age. Uh, so this, is, this chart is pretty much identical to the 5 to 11 age group. I will skip through that. Um, and this is the summary chart for the stepwise approach for patients above 12 uh, into adulthood. So the NAEPP work group has met a um, few times during 2015, and the work group published uh, their recommendations for um, updating the guidelines after 2015. There were six up suggested updates, and I will be discussing at length um, four specific ones that uh, are pertinent and actually um, clinically useful. And um, so this is the six updates that uh, I wanted to present. Number one is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, they're discussing whether the medications are, um, could be adjustable in, in patients who only have recurrent wheezing and not persistent symptoms. Um, I will focus on the addition of long-acting anti-muscarinic agents in asthma management, um, role of fractional exhaled nitric oxide, remediation of indoor allergens, specifically how house dust mite, and role of immunotherapy. Um, bronchial thermoplasty is beyond the scope of my expertise as an allergist, but um, maybe Dr. Dairid can um, address that at a later time. So the expert panel or the NAEP3 guidelines were very um, consistent with their recommendations, at, at least for patients with persistent asthma, these patients should be evaluated for um, potential role of allergens and are candidates for allergy testing. Um, asthma patients who are sensitized um, have increased asthma symptoms that eventually precipitate recurrent asthma exacerbations. In the US, um, a majority of asthma cases could be attributable to allergy and allergic triggers. And um, over 80% of school-aged children have at least uh, one sensitization to a common aero allergen. There um, are studies, and I included the, um, the references here, that there's a positive correlation between the number of positive skin test results with asthma severity. So the more allergic you are, the more likely um, you are to have moderate to severe persistent asthma. Um, I, there are a few important household uh, mites. Bolomia tropicalis is more, uh, probably more predominant in the uh, Philippines, um, but there's a bit of um, homology and overlap between these species. Um, but we test them separately because um, each species could still tr trigger its own unique epitope. Um, Dust mites, house dust mites usually live in bedding. They feed on um, dead, shed human skin. And they usually survive in low altitudes and um, relatively high relative uh, humidity of 50 to 70%. Um, so the evidence has shown that um, there is a causal relationship. So this is not just a, an association. It's not just a suggestion. Um, the studies have shown that there is a causal relationship between um, indoor biological and indoor chemical pollutants um, and asthma. So the first line uh, recommended for reducing exposures would be to use plastic casings for the mattresses and pillows. Um, so this should be allergen proof. I think these are available in Shoe Mart 
um, washing the bed linens uh, once a week and once a week in hot water. <laughs> Sorry for the plug. Um, avoid using down fillings for your pillows and duvets. Throw away stuffed animals, especially those that you can't wash. Um, this might be the last recommendation might be difficult to do. Um, reducing relative humidity might be um, difficult to do, but um, and in the states we um, you could purchase a dehumidifier. I, I'm just not sure how e efficient that is. And the second line would be using um, acaricides and tannic acid, using um, high efficiency uh, particle arrestants. Um, vacuum uh, cleaner bags to prevent aerosolized uh, house dust mite fecal material from being airborne. Um, so since these are heavy uh, particles, they usually settle on the ground after it's been stirred up in the air. So that's the reason why air filters or um, of any kind are unlikely to uh, be useful or helpful um, because uh, dust mite, house dust mite particles usually s uh, settle on the carpet. Um, soon after it's been stirred up by vacuuming. Um, this is just a, a quick um, review of the correlation between dust mite allergen uh, sensitization and asthma morbidity. Um, this is a double-blind placebo-controlled randomized controlled trial of 52 school-aged children and it showed a significant reduction um, in between reducing house dust mite exposure and um, dosing for inhaled corticosteroid group in, in the intervention group versus um, the asthma patients who did not have um, any house dust mite mitigation um, treatment. Um, this is also just a, a quick glance on previous history, a uh, previous, sorry, previous studies that have shown correlation between the development of asthma in children um, if they have a previous uh, sensitization to, to dust mite. Um, and this is the same, the same phenomenon is observed in adults. Now let's, um, I'm going to uh, change gears and talk about um, another aspect of the NAP guidelines, um, talking about adding long-acting uh, anticholinergic agents in the management of of asthma as an add-on to um, inhaled corticosteroids and LABA. Um, so previously there have been small proof of concept um, studies, uh, but three or four other studies have been published since 2007. However, by far the biggest um, study is Kirsten's. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012, where he showed in two um, replicate studies um, randomized placebo-controlled trial, um, the efficaciousness of tiotropium compared to placebo. So they enrolled 912 patients um, between the ages of 18 to 75. Um, the exclusion criteria would be smoke, smoking. And these patients have had a five-year history of asthma, not well controlled on inhaled corticosteroids and long-acting beta agonists. So these are patients who are already on step five to step six therapy. Um, they've continued to have FEV1s less than or equal to 80% predicted and a history of exacerbate one serious exacerbation in the past year. So one arm received tiotropium five micrograms per day using a soft mist inhalation or a respimat and the other arm received EVO. And these patients were followed for 48 weeks. So the previous studies have actually been um, much, much smaller, smaller cohort or the sample, I think the biggest one was um, 50. Um, so this is the biggest population so far. And um, the previous studies have also been a lot shorter. So this is the longest and biggest study um, looking at LAMAs um, in asthma management. Um, there are two primary outcomes that they looked at. At 24 weeks, uh, the, the tiotropium arm showed a significant uh, improvement in the peak FEV1 compared to baseline. Um, compared to the placebo group. And this was replicated in both trials and uh, with very significantly different results. The other um, outcome that they looked at was the pre-dose um, or trough FEV1 for um, the patient. So titropium is, is dosed at once daily. So 
it, um, it it's an ultra long acting um, anti muscarinic agent. So the next dose you you should expect some waning of its effect. However, they did not demonstrate that in the study, and in fact, the pre-dose FEV1 remained improved um, compared to the placebo with a very significant difference. Uh, one of the secondary outcomes that they looked at was um, time to first exacerbation and titropium was superior to placebo in um, overall reduction of risk to severe exacerbation compared to a uh, placebo arm. So I've included the um, the link here for the reference, so um, you could access the study um, in more detail. The FDA has um, approved at the current time three types, uh, three um, drugs, uh, three long-acting anti drugs. One of which has a shorter half-life and it's uh, dosed twice a day: aclidinium bromide. The other two, glycoprinum bromide and tiotropin bromide, are given once daily. So LAMAS is actually um, like a magic drug and so it's been studied quite well and I, I've uh, included one of the um, exhaustive reviews as uh, a reference here. Um, it has multiple roles and it um, can serve, it has anti-inflammatory function by inhibiting recruitment of eosinophils which is the um, culprit in airway inflammation and airway remodeling. Um, LAMAS do this by inhibiting cytokine production, namely decreasing IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. So these are important cytokines in the recruitment of eosinophils in the airway. Um, they've also found that it inhibits chemotaxis um, in, in uh, monocytes, neutrophils, and macrophages. It decreases mucus secretion by uh, decreasing or blunting mucus gland hypertrophy. So there's less mucus production, which is another um, pathophysiology that uh, causes sig significant symptoms in asthma patients. Um, and lastly, it, they've shown um, in animal and human um, subjects that it inhibit, inhibits smooth muscle thickening and um, airway remodeling, uh, which again is an important component of um, asthma uh, pathophysiology long term. So I've taken the liberty of um, putting LAMA here um, where I'm um, thinking that it's going to be added on um, in the stepwise approach of managing asthma in kids older, in patients older than 12, because it's not been approved for use in um, younger children. Um, that's for the third um, addition uh, to the updates, I'd like to uh, discuss the role of fractional exhaled nitric oxide or pheno. Um, so, so this is, there's a lot of excitement that's been generated by the discovery of uh, nitric oxide. So in 1987, Ignaro and Palmer um, described uh, a nitric oxide free radical and they figured out that it was um, actually the endothelium-derived relaxing factor. So they, they were calling this molecule uh, endothelium-derived relaxing factor, but nobody knew what it was. And then they realized that it was, in fact, nitric oxide. So since then, there's been a burgeoning amount of scientific um, data that uh, shows that nitric oxide is um, involved in multiple physiologic uh, functions of our body, including neurotransmission, immune function. It modulates vascular tone cardiac contractility. As well, it could be an important marker for carcinogenesis, um, ischemia reperfusion, hypertension, including um, pulmonary hypertension and septic shock. Now, for physicians and healthcare providers who take care of patients with asthma, um, its role in the lungs and in the airways is, is actually crucial and quite exciting. Sorry for <laughs> being excited about pheno. <laughs> Um, so it's uh, an important bronchodilator, vasodilator, and a non-adrenergic, non-gullinergic neurotransmitter. So um, it also is a very important modulator of the inflammatory response. So um, everybody was so excited about pheno that it was named Molecule of the Year in 1992. Parang class 90. 
So I included the, um, the reference here um, in case you would like to um, read this in greater detail. Um, but pheno is sort of like the breakout star um, in asthma management. So briefly, in the airways, it's, um, uh, it's produced by the breakdown of L-arginine to L-citrulline. And this chemical process is catalyzed by inducible nitric oxide synthase. So INOS is the predominant isoform of nitric oxide synthase in the airway epithelium. It is expressed by T lymphocytes and uh, ma macrophages. Um, and there's a clue to its presence. It, it, the production of uh, nitric oxide has, has a bronchoprotective effect and thereby preventing smooth by, sorry, by preventing smooth muscle proliferation. So the production of um, INOS and this uh, breakdown uh, to citrulline and producing nitric oxide is induced by different types of cytokines, um, namely tumor necrosis factor alpha, interferon gamma, IL-1 beta, and bacterial uh, produced endotoxins, giving us a clue that um, this is an important defense mechanism of the airway epithelium against pathogens. Um, the common measured way or method for measure, measuring pheno is via chemiluminescence or um, electrochemical cell technique, and it's reported in units as parts per billion. So recently, well, 2003, the FDA approved the desktop um, nitric oxide monitor, and um, last year or two years ago, the European Respiratory Society and the American Thoracic Society came up with guidelines um, on the use of pheno and how it's applicable to, to the clinical practice. Um, pheno is important because it's a surrogate marker of airway eosinophilic inflammation. So it's usually um, elevated and it differentiates different respiratory um, processes. Um, it's elevated in allergic asthma, bronchiectasis, allergic rhinitis, and eosinophilic bronchitis. So it can become an important biomarker of disease um, severity when we see our patients in clinic. And more importantly, it can clue us in whether that patient will be uh, responsive to steroids. So again, I've um, included uh, two different references here for, um, for your, um, if you would like to read about pheno uh, in greater detail. So in 2011, the American Thoracic Society published a working document on how we as clinicians can use the uh, pheno monitor, um, starting with the diagnosis of asthma. And um, I quote the, the document as saying, hi pheno, um, so the cutoff point for adults would be greater than or equal, equal to 50 parts per billion, and in children, um, pheno is naturally high, so there's a lower cutoff for exhaled nitric oxide in children, and the cutoff is at 35. The presence of high fractional exhaled nitric oxide is likely to indicate significant airway eosinophilia, and therefore these patients may be steroid responsive, mainly because eosinophils are, are very, very um, responsive to, to steroids. Now, it's also useful in monitoring the treatment response. So let's say the patient comes back for follow-up and um, the patient has been started on inhaled corticosteroids. These are um, a few possible reasons why the exhaled nitric oxide would persist to be elevated. Um, there could be allergen exposure, poor adherence, poor inhaler technique. So this will allow the clinician to address this with the, with the patient at point of care. Um, so my last, my last um, discussion will be the role of immunotherapy in the treatment of asthma. In a Cochrane review of um, 75 studies, including about 3,500 participants, uh, most of whom have asthma, they were able to show that there's a significant reduction in asthma symptoms and improvement in um, bronchial hyperresponsiveness and medication use after uh, patients have been started on an allergen immunotherapy. So um, there's, this is just one of those studies, one of those reviews, but there's a, a, a lot um, 
a plethora of these studies published that shows um, that immunotherapy is indeed useful and helpful for patients with asthma. Um, briefly, uh, patients on immunotherapy have uh, shown uh, these immunologic markers. Um, so there is some uh, physiologic changes in the immune response to allergen exposure. After immunotherapy, there is reduction in specific um, IgE or allergen-specific IgE. There's increase in specific IgG4, um, which is a um, subclass of IgG that is a marker for immune tolerance. There is a shift in the TH2 predominant cells, so the IL, uh, cytokine IL-4 uh, is downregulated. So there's a shift from TH2 to TH1 predominant um, uh, cells uh, in the body, in the blood, in the lungs, in the skin. And this is driven by the increased production of IL-10, um, TGF, beta, and interferon gamma, which are pro-inflammatory cytokines, as opposed to TH2 cytokines, which are um, more uh, driving the cells to be aller to produce allergies. And lastly, immunotherapy results in increased T regulatory cells, which again me mediates immune tolerance to um, allergen exposure. So this is um, my last slide. Uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to the importance of using spacers. Um, this is an example of a spacer device, but there are multiple products, multiple kinds of spacers. And the role of spacers is really to decrease the velocity of um, the meter dose inhaler particles. So they usually um, are uh, put in with a propellant uh, CFC-free propellant, and once it get, gets into this chamber, it would be easier for the patient, um, especially children and toddlers, to inhale at regular tidal breathing. Um, and this prevents um, medications from being deposited to the um, oral mucosa um, or the posterior pharynx where it's not needed. And it also decreases absorption, um, especially if the patient has is on um, inhaled corticosteroids with a high first pass metabolism. So it decreases exogenous absorption of these um, inhaled steroids, um, especially for the young kids who will be, um, whose growth can be affected by exogenous steroid use. Um, I included the link for um, the fact sheet for how to use an inhaler and a spacer device. And in the interest of time, I um, would encourage you to, to go to this site and review it or print it out and give it to your patients. Thank you for your attention.